Hi, I'm Donald Ray, a lecturer at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh. And in this webinar, I'm going to introduce the ARM University program DSP Education Kit. Over the course of 40 minutes or so, I'm going to explain what the ARM University program DSP Education Kit is. I'm going to give some background on hands-on DSP teaching. I'm going to say a little bit about different hardware platforms. And I'm going to demonstrate some example programs from the Education Kit. Finally, I'm going to explain how you can get your hands on a DSP Education Kit. So, what is the DSP Education Kit? Basically, it's a resource comprising hardware, software, and teaching materials. That is, lecture slides, uh, example programs that you can run on a microcontroller, and laboratory instructions that you can incorporate into your teaching. And these are all available from the ARM University program. The aim is that the DSP Education Kit can enhance the teaching of DSP by incorporating hands-on experiments into a course. Currently, these experiments make use of ARM Cortex-M4 processors, but we'll say, I'll say more about this in a little while. The DSP Education Kit joins an expanding family. There are education kits covering topics including microcontroller basics, system on chip design, operating system issues, and Internet of Things. The ARM University program donates these education kits to uh, universities worldwide. And for example, over 200 of the DSP education kits have already been donated. So let's explore the DSP education kit in a little bit more detail and start off by asking, what is digital signal processing? Well, there are a number of different ways in which you can answer that question. And I've got some example answers here. Increasingly, electrical engineering degree programs are incorporating the teaching of digital signal processing uh, into their curriculum. And this is becoming, some people are finding this more and more important. Another way of answering this question is to note that traditionally, digital signal processing is taught uh, using algebra, equations, mathematics in lectures. And it's a notoriously dry subject. Finally, this is the last example of answering the same question that I'm going to give you. As electrical engineers, typically we're interested in implementing digital signal processing in real time and the signals that we want to process are representing physical quantities. That's as opposed to processing data uh, offline. So, what about hands-on teaching? Hands-on teaching has a number of aims and objectives. Some of these are to bridge between the mathematical theory that I mentioned earlier that makes up DSP and to bridge between that and some more electrical engineering type topics. It's also aiming to bridge between that mathematical theory and the use of microcontrollers, both through the programming of DSP algorithms and through the interfacing uh, electrically of microcontrollers to the physical world using transducers and actuators. The uh, intention is that by carrying out hands-on laboratory experiments in digital signal processing, students may think a bit more about how to use microcontroller or microprocessor development kits, how to uh, actually write, develop, download, and execute programs on microcontrollers. It gets students to think a bit more about real-time programming issues some things that they may not have encountered in uh, their programming uh, courses already. And also, the aim is that students get to think a little bit more about I.O. methods. 
I'm thinking there of how we interface a real-time program running on a microcontroller to transducers and actuators that, of course, are our link from the microcontroller to the physical world. And finally here, the hands-on laboratory experiments are aimed at reinforcing, ultimately, the student's understanding of the underlying DSP concepts. Those concepts are uh, represented in the theory that makes up traditional DSP teaching, but what we want to do simply is not to introduce something new, but to get to the students to uh, have a better understanding of that theory. And the topics, the types of theory that we're talking about here are uh, sampling and reconstruction, representation of signals in both time and frequency domains, and then getting on to actual signal processing a little bit more, looking at digital filters, both FIR and IIR, and uh, considering Fourier analysis. In this case, Fourier analysis of discrete time signals, and therefore using the fast Fourier transform. Now, this list of uh, topics that I'm hoping students can uh, reinforce their understanding of, these are the topics that are covered, that you're helped in doing this by, by the DSP Education Kit. And then finally there, the DSP Education Kit covers adaptive filters as well. OK. Hands-on uh, teaching of DSP, uh, as represented by the DSP Education Kit, makes use of audio frequency signals. And that is deliberate and useful because it means that we can make use of test equipment and facilities that are pretty much ubiquitous in electrical engineering departments in universities. Here's a photograph, quite an old one, of my teaching laboratory at Heriot Watt University. And the point of this photograph is to highlight that I'm using the type of equipment that, as I said, is found in most electrical engineering departments. I've got an oscilloscope here, a signal generator, a PC workstation, and the test equipment that I mentioned there can handle audio frequency signals, the type of signals that the DSP education kit uses. If you look carefully in this photograph, you can also see a microcontroller development kit. That's uh, going to have the DSP example programs running on it. And on the left-hand side of the bench, you can see a set of laboratory instructions. These are not, in 2006, part of the ARM University Programs uh, education kit, but laboratory instructions, up-to-date ones, make up part of the DSP education kit. And, as I've said, this these type of facilities are ubiquitous uh, and you can do hands-on learning. I've done hands-on learning at a number of different universities spread out around the globe. Here's a photograph from China in 2006, another one later in 2014, and here was, in fact, a professor workshop in India in 2016. If you've got really keen eyesight, you may have been able to spot that the hardware platforms being used for these real-time DSP experiments are slightly different in each of these different photographs. This final photograph here uses the hardware platform that I'm going to demonstrate in this webinar. Basically then, what's going to be implemented on a hardware platform is a system like this. Ultimately, we're talking about processing analog audio signals. And as you can see from this diagram, what we need to do is we need to convert an incoming analog audio signal into digital or discrete time form. And we use an analog to digital converter for that. And correspondingly, on the output side, we use a digital to analog converter to convert discrete time or digital signals into an analog audio signal. And this is the system that, we imp that is uh, implemented on the hardware platforms that I've been mentioning up until now. In the center of this block diagram, a block is labeled digital signal processor. So let's think for a moment 
about what a digital signal processor is. Well, a digital signal processor is not something that's strictly defined. It depends on a device manufacturer whether or not they want to call their product a digital signal processor. But typically, if they do that, then their product will uh, feature most, if not all, of these uh, characteristics. Ultimately, a digital signal processor is simply a specialized type of microprocessor. But also, typically, it will have separate program and data memory subsystems. In other words, it'll have a Harvard architecture. Very often, it will have single cycle multiply accumulate hardware. It may also have circular addressing and bit reversed addressing implemented in hardware for speed and efficiency uh, reasons. And also typically a digital signal processor may incorporate on-chip memory, on-chip peripherals, perhaps encoder interfaces, PWM generation hardware, um, possibly even analog to digital or digital to analog converters. And finally, a digital signal processor typically will have low power consumption. Now what all of these uh, features in, uh, put together are describing is a type of device that has a lot in common with a microcontroller, perhaps not specifically for digital signal processing tasks, and typically, particularly the on-chip memory, the on-chip peripherals, and the low power consumption, we're looking at the type of devices that are put into embedded applications. So this is the type of uh, semiconductor device that we're talking about. In particular, over the years, semiconductor manufacturers such as Texas Instruments and Analog Devices have manufactured chips that they've specifically labeled as digital signal processors. And here's an example of a low-cost hardware platform that incorporates one of these so-called digital signal processors. In actual fact, the C6713 DSK from Texas Instruments is very widely used uh, around the world in uh, DSP hands-on teaching. However, a few years ago, ARM came out with the Cortex-M4 microcontroller. And this is an interesting microcontroller because it combines both DSP and microcontroller features in a very inexpensive type of device. Essentially, it's added various DSP-specific instructions and features to the previous or the existing ARM Cortex-M3 architecture. Using these uh, particular features of the ARM Cortex-M4 microcontroller, we're actually able to get something approaching what we might call DSP performance from a microcontroller, certainly for real-time audio processing. As a result, we can implement hands-on DSP learning exercises using something like this. The ARM University program DSP Education Kit is available for a number of different hardware platforms. All of these hardware platforms have ARM Cortex M4 microcontrollers on them, but they're manufactured by different companies. Currently, you can get donations from the ARM University program featuring ST microelectronics uh, devices or uh, NXP devices. But in this webinar, we're going to home in on this particular board. It's produced by Cypress Semiconductor. And as you can see here, it features their own implementation of the ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller architecture. I'm giving you a few more details here of the specific characteristics of that chip. Obviously, it's the large square chip in the center of uh, the PCB. Incidentally, the audio codec used on this board is identical to that used on the TI C6713 DSK. That's the TI DSK. And this 
is the hardware platform that we're going to be demonstrating in this webinar. One of the major differences between these two platforms is cost. If you were paying attention earlier, you'll have spotted that the C6713 DSK costs around 400 US dollars. The Cypress uh, FM4 hardware platform costs around 49 US dollars. So there's almost a uh, an order of magnitude difference in the cost of these platforms. This slide shows the connections to the Cypress development kit that are pertinent to the laboratory experiments that I'll be demonstrating shortly. Earlier, I gave a brief list of the topics that the education kit aims to enhance the understanding of. Here's a more detailed breakdown of the contents of the DSP education kit. There are sufficient uh, lecture slides for a typical 10 to 14 week course and the topics covered in the different lectures are listed in the left hand column. In addition to the lecture notes, as mentioned previously, there are lab exercise instructions and also code that corresponds to the experiments carried out. As you can perhaps see, the uh, topics covered start off with a review of fundamental DSP theory in terms of discrete time signals, convolution and correlation, sampling and reconstruction, aliasing, and the representation of signals in both time and frequency domains. The lectures go on to cover Z transform theory and then get into different filters. FIR filters are introduced using the moving average filter, perhaps one of the simplest types of digital filter of all. Then the window method of designing a more arbitrary FIR filter is introduced and explained and IIR filters are covered in a, a, a following module. Having covered those things, the fast Fourier transform is introduced and covered by the lecture notes and indeed uh, implemented in a lab exercise. And finally, the lecture notes go on to cover adaptive filtering, primarily LMS adaptive FIR filters. And they cover the different applications of adaptive filters, including prediction, system identification, equalization, and noise cancellation. The first program example that I'm going to demonstrate is a program called loopintra.c. It's very simple. It's kind of equivalent to Hello World. What the program does is it's going to pass samples of the input signal on the mic in socket through uh, the ADC and out through the DAC to the headphones out socket as represented in this block diagram. So here we have the Cypress card. I'm going to connect a microphone input and a loudspeaker output to the card and the card is going to be connected via a USB cable to a host computer running the MDK ARM development environment. And when we plug in the USB cable, the card is powered up and uh, some LEDs light to indicate that. This is the only program listing that I'm going to show you in this webinar. And the reason for showing it is because it forms the basis of many other programs in the DSP education kit in terms of its structure. Its structure is one that some students may not have seen previously in other programming courses because this program is going to run a real-time uh, process. At the foot of the source code listing we can see the main function and the main function in the case of this program does very very little. The first two function calls to GPIO set mode and to audio init essentially initialize the hardware on the board. In particular, they set up interrupts, they set up the interface between the processor and the audio codec containing the ADC and DAC. 
But once these devices have been initialized, the main function drops into an endless while one loop. Now, while the function main is doing nothing, interrupts are going to be occurring at the sampling rate of our signals. And that sampling rate in this case is 48 kilohertz. That in turn means that an interrupt service routine or interrupt handler function is going to be called 48,000 times every second. And inside that interrupt service routine, in this case, very little or even no processing is going to be done. Simply sample values are going to be read from the ADC and copied directly to the DAC. In effect, then, a signal is looped or passed straight through the processor. So now I'm going to switch windows to the MDK ARM development environment. And you may recognize the same program listing here in that development environment. What I'll do next is I'll build an executable file from that source code and also incorporating a number of library and support functions. And then I'll invoke the MDK ARM debugger. I'm going to uh, effectively download the program into memory on the processor on the Cypress card. And then eventually from here inside the MDK ARM debugger, I'm going to uh, run that program. So I'm now running the program, and as a result, now you should be able to hear my voice picked up by this microphone passing through the processor on the Cypress card and coming out of a loudspeaker. If you wish, using program echointra.c, you can add an echo to the signal passing through the Cypress processor. Hello. 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 This should Hello. be, should be sound 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 echo. 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 The next few demonstrations concern generating some output signals by writing sample values, discrete time sample values, to the DAC inside the audio codec and creating continuous time output signals, analog output signals. In this first example, I'm going to write a sequence of sample values taken from a sinusoid through the DAC in the audio codec, and we should uh, get a continuous sinusoidal signal on the output. We can listen to that through the loudspeaker, and we can also, through this connection, uh, look at that output signal on an oscilloscope. Here's that sine wave represented on the oscilloscope. Just in case that demonstration hadn't worked, I've included a screenshot of the sine wave on the oscilloscope. Now, there's something that's very easy to overlook at this point. It might seem uh, intuitive that if we, send, if we write a sequence of sample values taken from a sinusoid into our DAC, then we get a smooth sinusoidal output signal. But in actual fact, the DAC in our audio codec is doing something quite complicated. We can demonstrate this by looking at the result of writing the same discrete time input signal sequence of samples not only to the DAC in the audio codec, but to an instrumentation DAC built into the uh, Cypress chip. It has a simple DAC that has a zero order hold characteristic built in, and we can monitor its output through this lead into the oscilloscope. If we switch back to the oscilloscope and switch channels to look at the output from the inbuilt DAC instead, then we see something like this. This reinforces the idea that we're actually writing eight sample values per cycle of the sinusoidal signal into the DAC, 
but we get some quite different analog continuous time output signals as a result. If we come back here once again, just in case that experimental demonstration didn't work, I've taken a screenshot of the output on the oscilloscope. This next demonstration uh, using program square intra dot C involves writing a sequence of sample values taken from a square wave to the two different DACs. If we write that sequence of samples to the instrumentation DAC, then we see a perfect square wave coming out. And there's a screenshot of it. If, on the other hand, we write that, that same sequence of samples to the DAC in the audio codec, we learn something of what the audio codec is doing. It can't output a pure square wave. Instead, it outputs this uh, signal here. So switching to the oscilloscope, we can see both outputs. The blue uh, trace is the output from the audio codec. The red trace is the output from the inbuilt DAC. We can also listen to the sound that's coming out of the audio codec. More insightful than looking at the, the straight oscilloscope trace of the output signal from the audio codec is to look at the frequency content of that signal. As we've done here, the purple trace shows uh, a number of harmonically related and decreasing in amplitude frequency components, and they cut off at half of the sampling rate of the DAC. The next demonstration is of program Dimpulse Intra C. In this program, a single non-zero value or a discrete time impulse is written to the two DACs and we can observe uh, each of their different impulse responses. In the case of the audio codec DAC, the impulse response looks like this. And in the case of the inbuilt instrumentation DAC, the response to the single non-zero sample value is a rectangular pulse like this. Here are the two pulses being displayed live on an oscilloscope. We can gain an insight into the characteristics of the DACs, uh, particularly clearly, by inputting a pseudo-random binary sequence to both of them. In the case of the audio codec, we see a filtered pseudo-random binary sequence signal coming out, the yellow trace in this display. If we look at its frequency content in the purple trace, then we can see that it is strictly band limited to half the sampling rate of the codec. A similar experiment involving the DAC that's built into the microcontroller yields this slightly different result. As we see here, the frequency content of the output signal is not so uh, strongly band limited to half the sampling frequency of the device. We can listen to the reconstructed pseudo-random binary sequence and we can also display the two output signals on the oscilloscope. The significance of those last few demonstrations is that simply by attempting to construct continuous or generate continuous time signals by writing samples to a DAC, we can learn or we can use knowledge of digital signal processing. This next demonstration involves an FIR filter implemented on the Cypress card. We have a test signal comprising a recording of my voice plus an annoying uh, interfering tone. And initially, we can listen to that test signal being passed straight through the 
system here without the FIR filter operating on it. If we can filter them out. This is a recording of my voice to which we will... If we uh, switch on the FIR filter, then we can listen to exactly the same test signal, but filtered. To which we will add various noise and interference signals and see... If the band stop characteristic of the, filter, of the filter gets rid of the annoying tone. Earlier, we demonstrated the reconstruction of a pseudo-random binary sequence into an analog continuous time output signal and saw that it was band limited to half the sampling rate of the DAC. We can insert an FIR filter into the signal path and the result here using a narrow bandpass FIR filter is that the reconstructed output signal, analog audio output signal, is now bandpass filtered pseudo-random noise. By setting a GPIO pin high at the start of filter calculations in the program and resetting the GPIO pin low at the end of the calculations and looking at the GPIO pin on an oscilloscope, we can get a quick estimate of the execution time of an algorithm. Here is an example, uh, in fact, exactly the same program example that we saw running earlier both recorded for posterity in this slide and we can look on the oscilloscope at the GPIO pin live. These pulses are occurring one pulse per sampling instant and the width of the positive pulse represents the time taken actually calculating the FIR filter output. This next demonstration concerns the use of an adaptive filter implemented on the Cyprus device to identify an unknown signal path. In this case, the unknown signal path is from point A on the block diagram to point B, passing through the digital to analog converter, a cable, and then through the analog to digital converter. As adaptation takes place, the adaptive filter should adopt or take on the characteristics of that unknown signal path. Both the adaptive filter and the unknown path are excited using a pseudo-random binary sequence. And using program sysid simsys intra.c, we can listen on one channel to the pseudo-random binary sequence being output at the headphone out socket. And on the other channel, we can listen to the diminishing error signal uh, produced as the adaptive filter weights converge. We can listen to that uh, signal now uh, from the start of adaptation. After adaptation has taken place, we can stop the program and download the adaptive filter coefficients to MATLAB where we can investigate them and plot them. Here in this case is the impulse response or the values of the coefficients themselves and if we take the FFT of that impulse response we see the magnitude frequency response of the unknown signal path. At first sight it might appear that the unknown signal path is simply a cable. But remember the unknown signal path from A to B includes both the DAC and its reconstruction filter and the analog to digital converter and its anti-aliasing filter. Each of these contribute to a steep roll-off of the magnitude frequency response just below 4000 Hertz, half the sampling frequency. If we wish we can introduce an FIR filter implemented on the microcontroller into the unknown path. In this case, 
these are the results for a bandpass FIR filter and the resultant impulse response and magnitude frequency response are dominated by the characteristics of the FIR filter as opposed to the characteristics of the path through the DAC cable and ADC. This is the same uh, bandpass filter that was used to filter pseudo-random noise earlier. So that was a demonstration of a selection of laboratory experiments from the DSP Education Kit. How can you get your hands on the DSP Education Kit? If you're a university professor, you can contact the ARM University program at this email address and or you can visit the website, the URL of which is given here. The ARM University program will donate, in addition to the lecture materials and software code described in this webinar, professional licenses for the Kyle MDK ARM development environment and seed hardware. That's a few of the hardware platforms that uh, the laboratory experiments run on. If you're interested in a textbook that relates to this material, then here it is. Uh, whereas the DSP Education Kit contains 22 example programs, this textbook builds on that and actually contains 65 different program examples. The hardware platforms that are covered or may be used with this textbook include the Cypress Kit demonstrated in this webinar. So to conclude, the ARM Cortex-M4 microcontroller has real-time audio processing capability, including implementing FIR, IIR, and adaptive filters, and FFTs. Hands-on real-time DSP teaching is therefore feasible using very inexpensive hardware. And finally, as we've just said, teaching materials and hardware can be donated to university professors by the ARM University program.